and that that's the crisis. They said it's absolutely inevitable and almost always occurs on Tuesdays. That they make it through Monday on willpower, they've had the weekend off, but then Tuesday morning they just say I can't do it. So what you're trying to do, and I'll, I'll use this as, uh, the symbols mean nothing. I'm using a circle here, I'll use a square here, okay. Is you're literally saying to people, we want you to go from this holistic model to this one. Different culture and system in the two models. In this one, w working is dumb. In this one, working is good. In this one, going to work means you lose economically. In this one, going to work means you win economically. Different culture, different system. To show you an example of that culture, uh, Samuel Golden wrote a book about <laughs> growing up on the east side. And I just want to, in terms of everything you've heard about poor neighborhoods, poor problems, people who have difficulties, this is his description of the turn of the century uh, in New York City and the poorest neighborhood. Quote, now I want you to just listen to the optimistic, positive tone of his description of exactly the same neighborhood. This, these, these both can occur at exactly the same income level. Not a change in money. Be, being without money and being poor are two different things. It's the core problem we're faced with. Is that we, don't, we, we have messed up these two distinctions. This is what Samuel Golden wrote about his childhood. Where else on earth, among the poorest people, did you see in every home a blue and white box where you were supposed to drop your pennies? Once a week an old woman would come around and empty it and off it would go somewhere overseas. The poorest of the poor helping still poorer ones across the Atlantic somewhere. Hundreds of sweatshop employees, men and women who sat at machines for nine and ten hours a day, came home, washed up, had supper, and went to the lodge hall or settlement houses to learn English or to listen to a fellow read poetry to them. Paid readers of poetry. I saw it. I saw gangsters and bums, but I also saw poets, settlement workers, welfare workers, scribes, teachers, philosophers, all hoping and striving for one goal, to break away. And they did, too. America gave them all hope in life, and they repaid America. There has never been a more even trade. Zero. Zero, do you mind if we talk for a minute? Well, four. The same level of confusion, but because it was optimistically oriented towards a better future, it changed. He's talking about people who worked all day and then took a couple of pennies, maybe an hour's work, to go and pay the poet reader to the community center to, take, to give them part of their soul as well as food. This was a real world. This is not mythical. This is not some theory. This was America at the turn of the century. Uh, and I want to thank Kathleen Minix for finding that because I really think it begins to make vivid the healthy world of being without money which led to two generations of strength versus the unhealthy world of being without money which has led to two generations of disaster. But part of the reason I think that it's hard for us to really change things is that we underestimate the second reality. Cultural change is very hard. It requires tremendous persistence over time and can often only be achieved one person at a time. I think part of what happens to us is we say, okay, I'm willing to do this for like up to a year and a half. Well, at a year, it's a little bit like a farmer who says, I'll grow corn as long as it makes it in three weeks. Doesn't make it in three weeks, I'm throwing that sucker out and replanting. You know, the fact is, breaking through in a culture and getting people to start dramatically changing their beha behavior and then getting to enough individuals, because first what happens is you find one and then two and then three and then they find one and then gradually you begin to peel away the whole culture. The greatest study of this is the rise of the Wesleyan movement in Britain in the 18th century which changed the entire habit of the industrial poor and probably is the major reason Britain did not have a political revolution in the 18th century. But if you go back and look at the chapel movement of John Wesley and how, how Methodism, as it was called, uh, impacted on the English working poor, it is astonishing. But it starts small, it's very frustrating, and it doesn't fit either the news media or the government's need for instant gratification. It's just vi very hard, very difficult work. The third reality is that this kind of cultural change is best done outside government. And I would argue that, that with the exception of the military's ability to have boot camp, there is virtually no government program that gets the, the, the level of cultural change you need inside government. For, for the ver very reason that governments are very bad agencies of acculturation. I mean, all of you would be furious if you had some bureaucrat trying to acculturate you. You'd say, wait a second. 
I pay taxes. Who are you to tell me whether I ought to be in the circle or the square? Are you nuts? You work for me. I don't work for you. And so you have a very hard time ever getting an agreement for this kind of cultural change delivered by government. And this kind of change requires missionaries. This, this requires the person who sits there at 3 o'clock in the morning holding the hand of the person who is about to commit suicide. By definition, when you, you find wonderful government employees. You find people who are individually fabulous. But you can't recruit to a bureaucracy on the premise you'll stay there as long as they need you. You can recruit to a volunteer organization on that premise. Very different models. And so we, we sometimes get mad at the bureaucracy because we ask it to do things it can't do. Instead of being more careful about what government can do and what other sections can do. I would argue that government and politicians have found the first three realities unacceptable. They have therefore tried to find piecemeal, short-term improvements that at least meet their political needs and the public's desire to get something done. So what you've had is for 30 years now a series of underfinanced, short-sighted, uh, small efforts to get one thing or another to work when in fact this requires a big effort. You know, if you think back to our looking at the Normandy invasion, 74 small invasions would not have added up to Normandy. Normandy required that you consolidate all the effort into one massive all-out effort. This is the same way. Having 74 different tiny programs just means you've thrown the money away. Doesn't mean you can break through. And what you have to have, you can have a tiny program, but the tiny program's goal has to be changing the whole thing. It has to be to move people out of this culture and system into this one. Which is the fourth reality. That the cultural change must be, be from one way of life to another. Individual changes within the old culture are often overwhelmed by other aspects of the culture. Now this also means we're saying something that would have been vehemently rejected 20 years ago. We're saying basically that the culture of poverty and violence isn't acceptable. There are millions of Americans who live in that culture right now. And what we're saying to them is, look, it's be it is better to work than to be dependent. It is better to be safe than to be in danger. Now the word better is very argumentative. I mean, who are we to start imposing these, what would once have been called middle class bourgeois virtues? And the only good answer is, we have tried a technique of allowing this to grow and we can't stand what we see on television. We can't stand the pain we're inflicting on the children. We can't stand the four-year-old being thrown off the tenement house balcony. And we just know that's not right. And so we have to reluctantly come back to finding some way of saying, look, there has to be an improvement. Now, the encouraging thing, and this, is, this may, will surprise people who are very tired of this, including people, frankly, who have what I would call compassion exhaustion. You know, people who spent 20 years trying to help. It's never quite worked. They're terribly disappointed. They ought, to have, they ought to be optimistic. And the reason is, in America, very powerful reform movements can emerge very quickly and have very powerful impact. You, you can go from the Montgomery boycott of, of buses in 1955 to the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1965 in 10 years. And you get to a catalytic moment, you suddenly begin to have real change real fast. And you see this by looking just back at the American history. Great American reform movements, starting with the Great Awakening of the 1730s, which is a religious revival, uh, the Revolutionary Generation, the Jeffersonians, the Jacksonians, the abolitionists and the founding of the Republican Party, the progressive movement. Almost every one of those was a five to 10 year cycle of, of beginning to speed up uh, and consolidate. In the more modern era, you had uh, the New Deal. Uh, which did most of its best work in about five years. The Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Goldwater Reagan conservatism, and now we would argue renewing American civilization. That each of these are, 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 are belief systems that emerge, they codify, people say, yeah, that's right. And with amazing speed, the country changes itself. 